Standing up. Standing up. Standing up. Standing up for the world. Standing up for the world. Standing up. Standing up for the world. But we're sitting down for these interviews, right? (laughs) 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 These are stories about life, about Oxford, about the Rhodes Scholarship. Prologue. In our first episode in this series, I gave an overview of the 40 years of Rhodes Women Weekend, what it felt like to be there, what we talked about, and what we might take away from it. In this episode, we're going to hear a couple more in-depth interviews with women scholars who were at the anniversary. As Rhodes scholars, we're asked to stand up for the world, and that can mean a lot of different things to different people. It can also seem like an unrealistic, overwhelming, or even hubristic mission. These interviews explore how individual scholars stand up for things they care about and how they try to live out this call to action. I'm Kira Allman, Virginia and Maudlin 2010, and I host and produce this podcast series. I did my MPhil and DPhil at Oxford in Middle Eastern Studies, and I get asked a lot about how and why I came to study the Middle East. If I really go back to the root of it, I probably knew I would wind up working on the Middle East from about the time I was 15 years old. The region absolutely dominated American news at the time, in a post-9-11 era, and I realized that I didn't have any vocabulary or meaningful knowledge to talk about it. I felt like the national conversations we were having were stunted, polemical, divisive, and largely uninformed. And that made me angry. I thought that there was an injustice in that. It's easy to commit atrocities against a vilified other we don't understand. We had a responsibility to know more. I felt like I had that responsibility as an individual. Knowledge and sharing that knowledge would bring an essential dose of humility, uncertainty, and nuance to the conversation. Then we could do the real work of negotiating our relationship with the world. Jennifer Haverkamp served as the Obama administration's ambassador and special representative for environment and water resources at the U.S. State Department. In her remarks at the 40th anniversary, she said, we need more women in diplomacy. We're all trying to figure out where we fit, what we can contribute, on the issues we care about as individuals. So I wondered, how did being a woman factor into that? I wanted to know why she specifically called that out. So I asked her. A few things. Uh, One of them is, just as a general matter, I think women need to be better represented across all careers and all fields. And the in in both the environmental realm and the international diplomatic peacekeeping realm it seems to me that some of what are considered more conventionally strengths and interests of women are so very much tied up in in those issues Uh, environmental issues include concerns about children children's health future generations uh, air pollution you know mothers of children with asthma resonate with the need to protect our air, our, you know, water quality. So many babies die of diarrhea from poor water quality. Um, Women ought to be there helping set the laws and making sure they're enforced. And as far as international diplomacy, it takes listening and it takes empathy. You only get so far in negotiations if you're trying to force your position on the other side where you really achieve success is when you fully understand what is critically important to the other side and you find a compromise that lets you both go home saying, we got what we needed. And that takes listening. So I think women, not all women, but a lot of women are pretty good at that. This episode engages with scholars who see an injustice, a gap in the conversation that they want to tackle. I think that a lot of us share this drive and these are just a couple perspectives on that motivation. In chapter one, I talked to Jen Robinson, a barrister at Dowdy Street Chambers, one of Europe's largest human rights practices. The real world can be a deeply unfair place. And once you realize that unfairness, what do you do about it? In chapter two, I talked to Joy Bulamwini, a researcher at the MIT Media Lab who founded the Algorithmic Justice League to fight bias in coding. It turns out the virtual worlds we create are pretty unfair too. 
but the inequalities of cyberspace might be a little harder to see. How do we combat those blind spots? Chapter 1. The Real World Okay, I'm here with Jen Robinson. Jen is a human rights lawyer based at Dowdy Street Chambers in London. Jen, when you came up to Oxford, did you already know that you wanted to go into human rights law? Absolutely, and it was my um, it was my passion and my dream when I was an undergraduate student, actually. Really? So um, my interest in human rights law was spurred really from being an Indonesia specialist and learning Indonesian and living in Australia um, sort of coming to political consciousness as an adult when um, Indonesia was still occupying East Timor and the mm-hmm. Australian government intervened. I was very involved in sort of analysing and looking at that situation and assessing the human rights issues that were coming up. Mm-hmm. I then went to live in Indonesia and worked. ended up working in a place called West Papua, which is an occupied territory within Indonesia that is very little known, mm. working with political prisoners, torture victims, um, rape survivors, basically indigenous population that's being uh, discriminated against in what is an ongoing colonisation. And after you've experienced that and seen that firsthand, um, I realised that that was I needed to spend my time and my life and my skills on working towards helping people who are affected by injustice. Mm. And so that was always my goal coming to Oxford. Mm. And in fact, um, my academic supervisor will tell you and tells everybody um, (laughs) at length that I spent far more of my time at Oxford doing pro bono human rights cases than I did doing my actual thesis. You mentioned learning Indonesian. And when I was a kid, languages were sort of my first window into the wider world. So as soon as I had an opportunity to pick up another language, I took it. And it was my absolute favorite thing. Uh, I'm sure it's why I went on to study linguistics as an undergraduate. And when I decided that I wanted to focus on the Middle East, my very first decision was to enroll in Arabic classes. So I'm wondering how you wound up taking Indonesian and how much of an impact just learning that language had on the path that you followed. Well, I... um while I grew up in a very small country town and I went to government schools which weren't particularly well resourced, um, I had the opportunity of choosing between French or Indonesian Oh wow! at high school. Now, I know whenever I meet people all over the world, they're like, you speak Indonesian? They think it's yeah. so weird. And I'm like, put it in the context of the Asia Pacific. Sure. For me, as an Australian, learning Indonesian is like Americans learning Spanish. It's a 220 million person Muslim country just to the north of Australia Mm -hmm. 300 kilometers north of Australia to be exact Um, and it's it's actually mind-blowing that more Australians don't speak Indonesian but what's interesting is is that that was a very recent phenomena when I was a teenager so Australia really saw itself as part of Europe um, because we sort of see ourselves as part of the west and so we were still learning second world war languages at school French German for what end and so (laughs) I am the beneficiary of Paul Keating, who was an Australian Prime Minister, who really advocated Australia um, locating itself where it was in the world and learning more about Asian languages and culture. And so Indonesian, Japanese and Chinese, well Mandarin, was started to be taught in schools and I benefited from that. And I just happened to have this wonderful teacher. So it's all down to her really. I wonder if she even understands the impact that teaching me Indonesian had on my life. But I loved it so much and it gave me the opportunity to go to Indonesia at school. And for someone like me who, we didn't even have family holidays, let alone go away outside of the country. So for me, the opportunity to go to another country was just so exciting. And I went and my poor parents had to save and save and save for me to be able to go. Um, And it absolutely blew my mind. I remember coming back and sitting around the kitchen table when I got back to Australia and I was thinking, why do we eat what we eat for breakfast? Why do I wear the clothes that I wear? Why does why are the relationships in my family the way they are? Because I had seen another culture and seen a different way of doing things. And at, it just, honestly, I, I'm really intellectually curious and for me then travel and going abroad became a big part of what I wanted to do with my life. But I was also really compelled by, um, by what I saw in Indonesia and the injustices I saw which was then further compounded as the narrative of what happened was what Indonesia was doing in East Timor came to light 
and Australia then invaded as part of the UN peacekeeping force. All of these narratives came together to really inspire an interest in the world and in human rights. And so I thank my Indonesian teacher for that. Wow. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, Language teachers out there, I guess you should know that you really are changing the world. One challenge in working in human rights is definitely making it relevant. So how do you try to bring human rights down to earth and make it accessible? Is this a challenge that you've encountered? Well, I think it's true that um, in Western democracies, people have taken human rights for granted because we've enjoyed them um, and never had to fight for them. Right. Well, that's not true. At least not not in our memory. Not in uh, recent generations have not really felt um, under threat in the way that um, or, you know, economic development is at a certain level where you're not worrying about mm-hmm. where the next meal's coming from. I think making it relevant, I think I talk a lot about uh, empathy and um, storytelling and education. So sh- helping to educate the public, whether that's through film or um, through the work that we do, and publicizing the work we do through the media, through giving television interviews, through writing for the media, writing for the newspapers about um, current human rights issues and challenges and trying to involve people in those issues by storytelling, telling people stories, understanding what it might be like to be uh, a young single mother in this country whose benefits have been cut and she can't afford to live and is forced into homelessness or first on, forced onto food banks and what that might feel like. Um or showing people a film about, for me, an issue of great, um, my passion is West Papuans. Nobody knows where West Papua is, but it's in, in the first ever UN administered territory ever that was supposed to be brought to self-government and they ended up being illegally annexed by Indonesia and suffer a slow-moving genocide. And it's very hard to get the world's attention because you have to have the world's attention to be able to create the change that is required for them to be able to live, for their people to survive, um, and for the political change that's required for their independence. And so I think education and raising awareness is incredibly important. You recently started a documentary film initiative focused on human rights. Can you talk a little bit about that project and how film might overlap with this challenge we've been talking about, making human rights accessible, relatable, relevant? Sure. I've just started a company called um, Disruptive Narrative, which is uh, in partnership with my dear friend Sona Tatoyan, who's a Syrian-Armenian-American actress and producer. And it was a bit of a meeting of the minds in the sense that for the past five years, I've been working a lot with documentary filmmakers in helping them to create advocacy campaigns to run alongside their films so that we leverage off the back of the awareness that's raised through the distribution of the film and showing the film, which really engages people in an issue and makes them want to feel like they can do something about it. And so what is that action that we inspire in them as a result of seeing the film? And you, but at the same time, you can probably name some famous documentaries on one hand that you actually remember. So in recent times, Citizen Four about Snowden and US surveillance. Um, these films have a capacity to really change public, the public's perception around particular issues and un- helping them understand the issue and realise what's actually going on, which can fundamentally change the way that, if sufficient public pressure is brought to bear, the, the way government acts. Um, one film that I feel particularly passionate about is a film called The Act of Killing by Joshua Oppenheim, which is about the um, 1965 massacres in Indonesia. Now, I spent years working in Indonesia and on Indonesian issues around transitional justice. So what would it look like for uh, justice, trials, truth and reconciliation, and an open discussion about Indonesia's past and those crimes? And the conversation that that film had opened up in Indonesia and globally, change the way people talk about the issue in ways that I didn't think was possible. Now, if you can, if we can use film and art and culture in a way to open up these conversations that, so, you know, me standing up and giving a lecture about torture or me standing up and giving a lecture about West Papua independence and the right to self-determination and genocide, I might be speaking to a small group in a room and to the converted preaching to the converted but how do you reach out to people beyond that and I think film is a really powerful medium through which to do it and so as it happens uh, my friend is desperate to make a film about the Armenian genocide uh, which is uh, 
the incident in the Ottoman Empire which brought Lemkin to actually think about the word and name it genocide, <laughs> um, but is has been denied by Turkey for many, many years, over 100 years, and Turkey places inc- immense political pressure on other countries who seek to recognise it. And so we want to tell the story of the Armenian genocide because what I've also learned through my work is that narrative and whoever holds the information and the narrative holds the power. And so by telling the narrative from those of the of communities affected by injustice, you give them back power and you have the ability to um, open people's minds. Um, but it's not just about telling the story, it's about what we do with this story. And so we want to use the story to um, obviously advocate for greater recognition of the fact of the Armenian genocide, to tell a story that's long been censored and not enough people know about it, but also to use the narrative in a way that sheds light on what's happening today. So we're, we're going through a refugee crisis, people fleeing atrocity again and there's a there's a a sad historical resonance between the Armenian community that was forced to flee the Ottoman Empire and many of them set up homes in Aleppo in Syria and unfortunately that whole community is now being displaced to Armenia as a result of ongoing atrocities in Syria and bringing together that historical narrative with what's happening today we're employing young Syrian Armenian refugees to be the main characters in the film we're hoping to um, employ Syrian refugees and we're going to film in Germany, we hope, and employ Syrian refugees in the making of the film and use the film also to fundraise and talk about some of these issues and to, to use it to put a spotlight on some of these, th- to use it as an opportunity for affected communities to raise awareness and to raise funds for um, their issue. And that's the model that we'd like to take forward with disruptive narrative and hopefully make it commercially viable so we can continue to make stories like that. So we're doing this interview at the 40 Years of Rhodes Women anniversary, and I'd like to know why you personally felt you wanted to be here this weekend. I just think it's the most remarkable group of women who are doing remarkable things. So it's both an opportunity to um, connect with old friends, um, connect with people we admire and who I think have been trailblazers and can be mentors to us. And also to be generous and give back to the younger scholars who are here and provide them perspective and examples and ideas about what their life could look like. Because I remember being at Oxford and and even though I knew what I wanted to do, I didn't know what it was going to look like. And I felt quite a lot of anxiety and pressure being a Rhodes Scholar about what my next steps out of Oxford would be. And I think coming here as a community and being involved with the scholar community today um, and providing some sense of perspective about what's possible for them, the challenges we've faced, um, the challenges we will go on facing, this intergenerational conversation, I think it's mutually beneficial for everyone. So that's why I'm here. Since we're talking about the shared experiences of women and building a community of support and inspiration, do you ever think about the challenge of how to hold the door open for other women who have interests like yours? I think about that all the time. And in fact, one of the past five years I spent building a global fellowship program, which um, working with a a remarkable philanthropist at the Bertha Foundation, he he basically said to me, I was sitting at a lunch with Michael Ratner, who is my mentor, and this philanthropist who I ended up working for at the Bertha Foundation. And he said, Jen, I want to create a program so there are more lawyers like you. And he said, but I need a global legal champion. I think you're it. Come see me next week. And that started a five-year journey of developing a program to do precisely that, which is to create a paid fellowship so that... um, There are entry-level positions for young, aspiring lawyers in the best human rights public interest law firms around the world. We now support, well, the program, I no longer run it, uh, but I built it, uh, supports more than 100 lawyers every two years in 17 different countries. And part of that is not just giving them the opportunity, the opportunity for mentorship by, from remarkable lawyers, which is what I had access to because of the privilege of being here at Oxford. Um, so that more young people are learning how to do the law in this way, which is challenging structural injustice in a way that makes it better for a whole lot of people, but also showing how it's possible to be a lawyer doing this work. 
Um, and I think about that a lot. So now that I've finished building the program, I'm back into my own legal practice doing that work. But my next project will likely be um, I'm hoping to write a book about what it is to be a lawyer doing this work, providing inspiring examples from around the world of all the remarkable lawyers I've worked with in India and in Pakistan, in Mexico and Colombia, many of them women who have developed incredible innovative strategies about how we can use the law to create a more just society. And I think creating different projects to show people what's possible as a lawyer that the corporate law is not the only way forward and and it is possible to get into human rights and it's possible to have a very rich and fulfilling life as a human rights lawyer that to me is really important how do you stay motivated when it's hard to keep going when you're tired when the work is exhausting but you know it's the right thing and it's what you're meant to be doing i stay motivated in terms of my professional work through engaging with my clients who are incredibly inspiring people for the most part. And I think thinking about their experiences and what they're going through really drives me. But I also want to really impress upon other women working in fields like the law and in human rights law where it is very challenging. You're constantly pushing boundaries, whether it's because of the fact you're a woman doing it or because you're challenging the status quo you're taking on powerful interests, that can be exhausting. And so I emphasize self-care and being kind to yourself because it's not something that I'm very good at. We're all incredibly driven and incredibly motivated and want to change the world. And that often leaves very little energy and time for yourself. And you can't serve any of the objectives or the clients or the causes that you care about if you're not well and you're not taking care of yourself. And I think we can actually be really hard on ourselves. Chapter two, our virtual worlds. Okay, Joy, thanks for sitting down with me. Would you mind just introducing yourself and what you do? My name is Joy Balamwini, Tennessee and Jesus 2013, and I'm the founder of the Algorithmic Justice League, doing a PhD at the MIT Media Lab. Amazing. So I feel like I've met a lot of superheroes this weekend at the 40 years anniversary, and the Algorithmic Justice League sounds like something that belongs in a Marvel series. So can you tell me a bit about what it actually is? Uh, I'm kind of picturing capes and superpowers and all sorts of things. Sure. Well, the Algorithmic Justice League definitely has some superhero elements. We have a villain, and the villain we have is the coded gaze. So you've no doubt heard of the male gaze. There's also the notion of the white gaze. And we fight the coded gaze, which is our term for algorithmic bias. So discrimination that can be embedded within the technology we create, the prejudice of the past if we're not intentional intentional and careful about the data we use, the type of algorithms we create can actually be embedded in the technology of the future, but under the guise of machine neutrality. And so when we say we fight the coded gaze, the Algorithmic Justice League has a mission like other superhero kind of worlds, but this is our real world and the Algorithmic Justice League is very much a real entity and really needed. This is interesting and challenging, right? Because the coded gaze sounds like a pretty slippery bad guy to be taking on here. Algorithms are the underlying logic of modern computing, but we can't see them. And most people don't think about how the software they use is coded. So as far as villains go, this one's pretty hard to point at and say, well, there it is. With the coded gaze, you can't exactly just like punch it in the face. So um, how do you fight it? So we fight the coded gaze in three ways. The first is to highlight bias, right? Because to your point, if you can't see it, how do you address it? And how do you make sure that not just the digerati or the people who are in the halls of the high priest of tech have access to understanding that there's bias in technology or even seeing examples, but the people who are most 
impacted by it, right? If I talk about facial recognition not working, sometimes I'll get a question, can computers see, right? What is this computer vision, machine learning? It's this whole other world, another language. And so part of our work with highlighting bias, right, and algorithmic bias in general is to make it more accessible so people are aware that machines aren't flawless. And in fact, they reflect our flaws in ways that can be harmful if we're not careful. The other thing that we do in terms of fighting the coded gaze is identifying bias, right? One, highlighting that it exists, but also from a research perspective, building rigorous tools so the people who are designing, developing, and deploying these systems have ways where they can check for bias as they're making the technology so we can make sure we're creating systems that work well for all of us and not just some of us. And then finally, mitigating bias. Great, I'm aware, I can identify it. What do we do? And what do we do really depends on the context. When we say things like artificial intelligence or machine learning, we might speak about it in a general way, but when it comes to addressing specific problems, we have to know what's the context. Is this something that's being used in health? Is it being used by law enforcement? And so forth. And so when it comes to mitigating bias, it's really about working on specific issues. So what are some of the examples of what this bias looks like? How does it manifest? And how did you get involved in working on this issue? So part of how this bias manifests is we don't always see it, right? Because it's under this guise of machine neutrality, One of the things we've been able to do when it comes to communicating bias is showing a visible example of it. So a visible example I've been using is my own experience of coding in a white mask. So there's automated facial analysis technology that can be used to recognize faces, it can be used to track faces as they move on a screen and things like that. And so at the Media Lab, I have the opportunity to work on all sorts of projects. One of the projects I was working on was something that would allow me to paint walls with my smile. And (laughs) what I mean by that is I could take a camera feed of my face, right? So I'm just looking into the camera. And as I move my face, right, a smiley would follow my face. And then you use a projector to put that on the wall, right? Right. So that's what I mean by painting walls with my smiles. And then we also added a music beat to each of the different smiley faces and different people could do it. So it's this whole collaborative thing. So it's this thing that was just meant to be whimsical. I found that my face wasn't tracked that easily until I put on a white mask. And then it was, I was like, oh, this this does work, you know? And it, it, it worked on the people with lighter skin in my group better than it worked on the people with darker skin. And so that's a visible example that you don't always see. And I started asking why, Yeah. right? What was going on? And I started looking at the data that's being used for computer vision. So computer vision can use machine learning techniques to pick up patterns. What's machine learning? We got a bunch of data. We learn from that data. We find patterns and we apply it in useful ways. So one of the patterns you can teach a computer is the pattern of a face. Sure. How do you teach it this pattern? You collect a lot of examples of faces. If these faces aren't that diverse, people who aren't as well represented might not be as well detected, right? And so knowing that, I started looking at the actual benchmark data sets that we have for different types of computer vision tasks, mainly focused on faces. Yeah, so going back to that raw data. Going back to the raw data, getting really, if we're talking about the coded gaze, we're digging in, right, to fight (laughs) this adversary. You have to, you have to. Right, so it's almost like a special ops mission. So (laughs) so to to get at the issue with within the facial tracking setting, we decided to go to the National Institute for Standards and Technology. There they keep the benchmarks. That's the headquarters for the benchmarks. So we got a hold of the benchmarks and we did something really simple. We said, okay, let's look at male representation and female representation. 75% male national data set released in 2015. Wow. Okay. Let's look at the representation of people of color. Well, it was 80% pale, so not so much representation of people of color. And then I said, okay, let's borrow a bit from feminist with the idea of intersectionality. We embrace multiple identities. Let's look at this by skin type and also by gender. The skin type gender breakdown for that national data set, 60% pale males. 
only 4.4% women of color wow. based on the analysis we did of the 500 unique individuals that made up that data set. This was 2015 when that benchmark was released is currently being used, right? And so for me, I'm saying, no wonder we're not even seeing the issue if the very benchmarks themselves are so skewed. So I realized there's a huge problem with representation in the first place and not just representation in the data, but the people who are gathering the data and making the algorithms and making the decisions around technology. We already know the participation in STEM is very low yeah. in the US context for women and people of color, yeah. more broadly speaking. But there are also cost of inclusion and cost of exclusion, right? So knowing that facial recognition in the hands of governments can be used for surveillance in the hands of companies mm -hmm. can be used for persuasive, mm -hmm. manipulative persuasion, really, um, and in law enforcement for profiling or personal adversaries for all sorts of things, right? It's making sure people are aware that it's being used as part of what we're trying to do. So beyond just raising awareness, what are you doing to change how coding is done? We're also creating international standards for facial recognition to wow. say, what does inclusivity look like? What does diversity look like? It's one thing to call for it. It's another thing to actually go into the weeds and be specific, right? These phenotypes should be a part of it. If you're going to use it in a high stakes situation, as a police department, you have to show and run accuracy tests. Absolutely. There are no federal regulations on facial recognition in the U.S. right now. That's kind Only, of unbelievable. I thought so, too. I actually learned this from the report, the perpetual lineup that came out of Georgetown Law wow. that showed one in two adults in the U.S., that's around 117 million people, have their faces in these uh, uh, facial recognition databases that can be searched by police without warrant in most places using algorithms that haven't been tested for accuracy, at least publicly to say this is how well it works across a range of demographics. This is the world we live in right now. And once I realized that, it was more than painting walls with my smile. I was like, oh my goodness, there's a justice case. And hence the <laughs> Algorithmic Justice yeah. League was formed. And we, we fight the coded gaze, both in the spaces that it's visible, but more importantly, in the spaces that it's invisible. Who's involved in the Algorithmic Justice League? And how do you make sure the people who really need to know about this know about it? Okay, so in terms of who's involved, we invite everybody, artists, activists, coders, anyone who cares about fairness, curious people, like how does this technology even work? And so earlier I mentioned the three main components for the Algorithmic Justice League. And so with each of those components, we work with different types of people. So the first component, highlighting bias, there I work with filmmakers, producers, videographers. Cool. It's very much about storytelling, right? Yeah. And so I work with storytellers who have skills of all sorts to get across the message of what's going on. The other part is really working with researchers, right? So for identifying bias, working on publications across different domains, because this isn't just about artificial intelligence or computer vision, right? It's I'm working with social scientists, political scientists as well, people with deep expertise in gender studies and women's studies. So it, it, for me, I feel like this is a space where so many people can come together on the research component of it, thinking about its current implications, its future implications, and how they can be mitigated moving forward. And then finally, when it comes to mitigating bias, I've been so fortunate to work with uh, Boku which is a, a local kind of tech boutique advisory that builds technology. And we've been working to create different data busting tools. Cool. So we're working on a data destiny project right now where we're thinking of how do we reclaim our data future? How do we address data gaps or data poverty and things of that nature? And so in working with them, you have engineers, you have designers as well coming on board. And so I have quite the range of people yeah. I might be working with. And then I also have the opportunity to work with the MIT communications department specifically at the Media Lab. 
as a woman of color working in this space, you're in a STEM field, you're a coder, and there probably aren't many people that look like you doing this kind of work. What has that experience been like for you? How has it shaped you? So for me, I have seen it as an opportunity because I bring in various perspectives. When I finished my undergraduate, I started Texturized with three other brilliant women of color with backgrounds in computer science and chemical engineering. And we were addressing hair care in a way that hadn't been done before. Send us a sample of your hair. We'll run some electron microscopy on it. We get your unique hair print and then we give you the products that work best you know, on your hair, your unique hair type, that kind of thing. And I don't know how many white men might have come up with that kind of company. Even when I was uh, in Zambia as a Fulbright, how I got into rights and code in the first place was I got connected with an organization called Asikana Network. And when I asked, what do you want to create? They're the ones who said, let's do a women's rights app, right? And that women's rights app then influenced the creation of Code for Rights here at Oxford University, which led to the first response app that was developed by about 40 women who were studying here at Oxford. And so just working with women and seeing the issues they care about, I think has been an incredible opportunity. Being one or one of few or, or, you know, that I've reached out to my mentors who have paved the way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to go in and realize that even though you're not well represented, your voice matters and you need to claim that space Mm -hmm. to make room for others to come in as well. And so that's how I view myself within tech, that it's an opportunity as a woman in tech to bring in important perspectives to make amazing technology that's going to help humanity, right? And to also make room and space at the table for others. Are there things that we can do as individuals if we want to confront the coded gaze? Absolutely. So one of the things we really care about at the Algorithmic Justice League are people's stories and narrative. And at the end of the day, that's how cultural change happens. And so we collect bias in the wild stories where people submit cases of something went wrong. Maybe they think it's biased. They don't know. But there's finally a place you can go and ask. We get a lot of people who tell us about their not so great experiences with Snapchat filters, right? We we had one um, person submit a story about how their, their Ethiopian son who's adopted and their dog get labeled as the same with the technology that they use. We had another person who submitted a story about a coworker and they have an advanced uh, automated facial analysis system that's part of their video conferencing system. And they, she has to use specific rooms because not all of them work well for her. And this is what I call the exclusion overhead. So sometimes people ask, oh, is it? does it never work for you, that kind of thing? And I'm saying, does it work well for all of us? Because if you have to be going to specific rooms, that limits your productivity. If you have to be bringing, I don't know, flood illuminators in an already lit room, let's think about typical conditions. Is it working well for all of us in the way we live? Or are we asking other people to change themselves to fit technology instead of fitting technology to us? Epilogue. Joy and Jen talked about storytelling. It's a way to share what they know and also to learn from others about their experiences. Confronting injustice, they said, requires empathy, and empathy can be shared and cultivated. In the areas where it's undeveloped or underdeveloped, in individuals or communities or nations, we can facilitate its growth. A tiny seed of empathy can slowly change centuries worth of bias, blindness, and rage. These are just personal stories of the ways these scholars are working in their own fields in their own corners of the world. But even in that specificity of experience and mission, I think we can take some wider wisdom away. Empathy is power. Knowledge has to be shared. Women should be at the table. And we are.
The Rhodes House podcast is brought to you by The Rhodes Trust. It's produced by me, Kira Allman, and original music for this series is by Connor Malloy. You can stream these podcasts on the Rhodes Trust website. Thank you.